Well, good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the 24th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee? Can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile devices as they do affect the broadcasting system? Although, having said that, some members may consult their papers uh, on tablets during the meeting. Uh, agenda item one is items in private. Can I seek the agreement of the committee to take item three in private to consider uh, the evidence that we hear today on the draft budget scrutiny. Um, I should also have said, sorry, that uh, we have today James Kelly substituting um, for Mary Fee, just for the record. Move on to agenda item two, draft budget scrutiny. Uh, we're going to hear evidence today on the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2015-16. And this year, the committee is focusing its budget scrutiny on three of the Scottish Government's national performance <coughs> indicators or figures, namely reducing Scotland's carbon footprint, reducing traffic congestion, and increasing the proportion of journeys to work by public or active travel. So in order to assist us in, our scrut in this scrutiny today, I welcome Professor Gillian Annabel, Chair of Transport and Energy Demand at the University of Aberdeen, Francisco Asque, Director of the Centre for Business and Climate Change at the University of Edinburgh, Professor Susan Roth, Roth uh, School of the Built Environment, Harriet Watt University, I hope you've got the name's right, and Professor Michael Foreman, uh, not unknown to this committee, Chair of the Digital Scotland Working Group from the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Can I welcome uh, you all today? And can we move directly to questions and perhaps start on um, your views of the impact of the draft budget on greenhouse <laughs> gas emissions? Can I ask what you consider the likely impact of the draft budget on greenhouse gas emissions? Who would like to start on that? Professor Roth, perhaps is it your um, area? Yes, so the impact of the draft budget on greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> I think, unfortunately, it would be less than I would like um, because of the way um, the um, division of the, the different accounts are um, organised so that we have, for instance, um, an idea of the exact amounts for different, the relative weightings for different areas being allocated, for instance, to energy, to, um, what have we got here? We've got energy, um, water, waste, and so on. We know percentages of their impacts, but it's very difficult to follow that through the budgeting process. Um, there are also, I think, that uh, the draft budget might uh, benefit from being more graphically clear, so it was easier to understand so that we had graphs of trends rather than pie charts, so people could see the relative um, development or the, the um, reduction um, of particular trends within the system. I don't know if that's been brought up. Um, and another thing is that there is slight lack of clarity here on some of the impacts of the changes in the accounting methods, yeah? So we've had a change in the accounting methodologies in Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. So that's resulted from a significant um, readjustment of the carbon budget figures from what was um, previously um, published and trended. But it gives us um, what percentages responsible for those changes in the published figures, but it doesn't give us the exact extent of how much impact as a whole um, the changes in that accounting method have made. Um, at that point, I'd like to pass over to colleagues. 
I, I would agree that it's very difficult to say what the impact of the draft budget is on Scotland's green, greenhouse gas emissions um, because of the, the limitations of the method that's been used to assess the carbon impact. And essentially, the greenhouse gas emissions um, estimated under the method are, are roughly proportional to spend, and they are based on... Um, past sector average emissions for the sectors that the goods and services are being produced by. So really the only way to reduce this measure is to reduce government spend overall um, or to wait for sectors to be decarbonised and for that to be um, reflected in the sector averages after a time lag of a few years. So I, I think that actually if we wanted to have a better sense of the impact of the draft budget, you would want to split it into capital expenditure and recurrent expenditure. With the recurrent expenditure on goods and services, what's relevant is not the sector averages of the sectors that produce those goods and services, but what we're doing in green procurement to actually procure goods and services that are lower carbon intensity than the sector average. So I think the sector average would give you a useful kind of benchmark to say this, this is the baseline, but actually the more important story would be what is the government doing in green procurement across the board, and that would have to be measured with a different bottom-up methodology based on what different departments are actually doing in their green procurement strategies. And with, with capital expenditure, the question that I think is important is, are we locking in higher emissions over the lifetime of that capital or lower emissions relative to what we might have otherwise uh, spent the capital investment on? And again, that, that isn't captured by the methodology, which only gives you a sector average. So what's really relevant is, you know, how green are the buildings that we're building? How, um, yeah, and, and uh, uh, another, another limitation of the current methodology is that it only captures some of the emissions associated with the production, the direct emissions from the production of the goods and services um, and the indirect emissions from the electricity consumed in the production of those goods and services. Um, but it misses the hugely important area of what are the emissions associated with the, um, with the lifetime use of the, the equipment or the, or the capital item that is, is, is being invested in. So the example is, is, is cited in the report, um, has been for the last few years, of, of counting the emissions from the manufacturer of insulation but not the emission reductions that that results in in the building that the insulation is installed in. Likewise, it you know, counts the emissions uh, from the construction of a road but not the emissions from all of the vehicles then using that road. Um, and, and really, I think, to get a better sense of the long-term impact of capital spending we should be looking at, we should be incorporating those uh, lifetime um, use emissions or emission reductions as well. We can't look at the budget just in isolation. We've got to look at in relation to documents like the carbon emissions reduction documents, which are huge, that uh, the Minister for the Environment publishes um, every now and again. I mean, the part, the, the, um, the, the, the Parliament has, you know, discussed them, as has this committee um, at length. So, I mean, you can't expect everything to be in a budget document. I think they have to be looked at in relation to, to these other documents and see where the, the direction of, of travel is, surely. That's, that's true, and there are a lot of different carbon accounts being produced. But I think what's important is, is whether you can actually... Um, draw linkages between them that are, that are meaningful and, and useful. I, um, I, I struggle to see how the account currently being produced for the draft budget can actually be used. Whereas if it 
linked directly to um, the accounts that are done for the under the RPP. Um, is, that, is that the right word? Um, the report on. Um, it's just escaped me. Programs and policies, is it? Um, then, yes, possibly you, you could actually produce more meaningful, useful information by saying what is the change in budget allocation to these different policies and, and measures that have been estimated elsewhere. And if you've got a change from, from one year to the next, then you can actually say, well, we are, we are reducing spend in such and such an area that is producing a lot of emission reductions versus you know, increasing spend in another area that perhaps increases emissions. So you'd be able to get a much better sense then um, if there were these kind of much more explicit links across. There aren't those links at the moment because the two methodologies being used are, are completely different and incompatible. Um, but I think it would be possible to do a different kind of estimate of the impact of the draft budget by looking across at other accounts that are being done in a more bottom-up way across government. Yeah, I think we have asked for that um, to be provided before, but um, it's not happened yet, I don't think. Yes, Professor Off. Um, I think this is the issue of the second round of missions that they put in the, the summary there. Um, they said that, that um, the, those impacts are not included. And again, the question is, should, should they be par in a parallel document? But within the data that we're given here, there are some connections between um, the actual spend in pounds and um, the, the carbon impacts of those, which are, are quite clear. So, for instance, if you look at what I would call, um, well, these are incomes to the um, budget, which uh, include things like uh, oh, uh, co college operational impact. Um, it's where the Scottish government has earned money, yeah? And there are allocated carbon impacts of those, those monies earned. And very noticeably, in the EU, um, money that has come into Scotland, under the agriculture, the rural affairs, food and environment, you see typically that, that um, the, the carbon impact of the uh, monies coming in is typically um, about a quarter, a third, maybe 2% of in terms of carbon of the um, money invested until you get to the EU-supported and related services and you get less EU income. And we see that, um, this is on page 19, we have income of 488 million um, pounds into the Scottish Government, which results through the agricultural policies um, resulting from that expenditure f from the EU in a significant, uh, huge reduction in the amount of carbon emissions um, from Scotland. So we can see that that specific line of EU investment has been really significantly effective in reducing carbon from Scotland. Um, but technically it's not included uh, in the budget because it's income. But for some reason that particular investment was very, very effective in reducing emissions from Scotland. But I think across the board in the other figures, I don't know if you've found this in transport or digital stuff, that, that there isn't such a, a huge visible impact from the expenditure of the Scottish Government um, to carbon impacts. Well, to co comment on transport, my, my comments are rather less detailed in terms of, of budget lines and uh, more observations with regard to the balance of expenditure on various aspects within the transport sector and their um, impact on carbon. Um, so what I mean by that is that essentially what you have is um, a very um, uh, heavy expenditure on um, roads, motorways, trunk roads, um, and a very small proportion of the overall expenditure on sustainable travel modes. Now, 
um, right, right there, what we're seeing is um, very little overall expenditure on any demand management attempts. The, the carbon reductions are, are largely concentrated uh, on vehicle technology, on expenditure on um, promoting the uptake of electric vehicles. And the carbon accounting that, that surrounds that policy line, that expenditure line, uh, is very much based on assumptions about uptake of vehicles, but also against the projections of, of vehicle, um, of car ownership and use in Scotland, um, which themselves can be questioned um, in terms of um, the, the rate, the potential rate of traffic growth and what it is likely to be or what it could be given other types of expenditure. So um, I do think that um, the, the, the type of scrutiny that, that I would prefer, that, I, well, that, I, that I'm, I've done, that I think um, should be considered is much more um, in relation to um, whether or not the transport sector is expected to pull more weight than it currently does in terms of reducing carbon, uh, particularly the road transport sector. Uh, um, subsector, if you like, um, which is increasing in terms of the pro proportion of emissions that it's contributing to Scotland's carbon budget. It will come on specifically to, to transport um, in a minute, but can you identify any examples or projects and programmes that will have a positive impact on reducing Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions or its carbon footprint? Um, it's very clear that the built environment plays a huge role in the carbon emissions from Scotland, yeah? And yet, if you look on page 16, under planning and finance environment sustainable growth, um, there's a, a very small amount of money allocated to building standards. And, with, and it has a very small carbon impact. Um, well, if I, was, if I was looking at Scotland leading the world, as I always do look to Scotland to lead the world in this field, I would say that we could very reasonably um, implement and develop, and I know they're doing this already, a new tranche of um, forward-looking building regulations and approaches that would, would um, have huge carbon impacts. For instance, I'll give you one particular example. Under the European Building Directive, we have, to, um, we have a duty to report the carbon emissions predicted to be used in buildings under, under our standard assessment procedures. Um, what's happened over the last three or four years is that it's become patently clear that the building models they use to model buildings do not reflect in any sense the um, actual performance of buildings in use. So there is an enormous gap between what the modelers, the engineers or the architects say is going to be how a building performs, which is reflected in the certificate that is placed in public buildings and the amount of energy that um, these buildings use. For instance, if we were like an MOT, if we had a system whereby the actual energy use every year was reported in a standard format, what they call, instead of a, an energy performance certificate, EPC, under the European Business Directive, if it was um, a DEC, or Declared Energy Certificate, um, where they had to report actual um, energy use or emissions, and um, feed it back into a central database, like you do with the MOT for cars, yeah? Not too difficult, some investment was put in that. That, I believe, would lead to quite a significant, a real significant improvement in building performance as actual performance is declared. But um, that... Does anybody, do, do any countries do that currently? Yeah, um, England does it. Um, a lot of European countries do it. Australia um, does it, um, Sydney does it, every single big building in Sydney has to report its actual energy expenditure which is published on a certificate on the wall, is this an ABCD building? For some reason the building standards in Scotland decided to use predicted, 
but I think the credibility of the predicted models using building modelling systems has been in the last couple of years um, sort of rather discredited. There, it's a good indication, but often it's three, four, five times different from what buildings use in practice. So, I mean, cranking that down, turning that screw, because, of course, the estate agents and so on often put in pretty strong objections because they don't want to be landed with a basket full of turkey buildings that they can't move on, yeah? But that's at the expense of the, um, the buyer buyer's understanding of how buildings perform. Well, actually, and we can certainly ask yeah. um, the government minister um, about that when they, when they come in on the budget. Um, and now one other section here is if you look on page 20, we have housing and regeneration. We seem to have some fairly hefty um, budget lines supporting sustainability. Um, which have some impact, um, but um, it's not very clear in either the budget or the non-budget what, what are the, um, I mean, that's an example of a significant investment line supporting transitions. What's being invested? I mean, that's... There, there are very many examples of where the Scottish Government is doing fantastic things and, and, and can do even more to reduce emissions. And I think the biggest sectors would be the built environment, probably transport after that, and then agriculture and, and forestry. Um, well, because, it's, because energy policy is already kind of fixed, I haven't included that. Um, but you can't infer any of that from... from these figures. It, it's, simply not, it's simply not visible. You know, the, the supporting sustainability um, line that Sue mentioned, you know, it, it is only showing up as a positive contribution to emissions because it's just measuring the, the, the emissions associated with the production of whatever it is that, is that that is being spent on. But presumably all of that stuff is producing really good outcomes over the lifetime of the buildings that it is going into. Likewise, um, on page 19, there's um, 23.9 thousand tonnes allocated to woodland grants. Now, I know from my involvement with the Woodland Carbon Code, which was developed by the Forestry Commission here in Edinburgh, that you know that program has incentivised over a million tonnes of carbon sequestration, that doesn't show up in the account. All that we see is the emissions from, you know, spending the money, planting the trees, um, and, and so forth. So, you know, we, we, we know there are good um, stories, we know there are things that need to be looked into further, but it's simply not evident from this particular carbon account. Okay, does anybody else have any further examples of projects that um, will help redu the reduction? Could I, could I just say a little bit about, I presume I'm here because of the effect of digital, because I'm not an expert in, in carbon, but on the other hand, there are a lot of things that we see from digitisation that actually do help to reduce energy use and carbon emissions. So changes of transport patterns in particular, people working from home or consolidating orders instead of everyone driving 20 miles to the shop one van comes and does around and, and delivers everything um, there's smart energy in terms of improving the efficiency of energy usage in the home which is something that has huge potential according to recent studies I've seen and there's also the fact that the the technologies, the, the communications and, and computation technologies that we use are themselves significant uh, users of energy. And things like cloud computing can actually make that use of energy far more efficient. So I don't see anything trying to draw those lines out in, in the accounting that's been done here. And I think that if we were really to understand what the impact of digital could be, there ought to be some more work done to make that linkage. Another example of one of these induced effects that are, that are currently um, excluded. Um, I just wanted to add one, one point, which is that um, you know, roughly, roughly half of the UK's emissions are 
um, controlled under the EU emissions trading scheme. And we actually can't do anything to reduce emissions further from those sectors because any reduction that we could produce within Scotland or the UK would simply allow emissions to be increased somewhere else in Europe because it's subject to a Europe-wide cap. So an incremental improvement that might possibly be feasible with the existing methodology might be to exclude EU emissions trading scheme sectors from the account so that you can actually get a picture of the emissions that the Scottish Government actually could do something about. And that would, you know, the obvious sectors would be agriculture, forestry, all, all the rural things, um, and, and the built environment and, and transport. Mm -hmm. Okay, Professor Roth. Um, yes. Can I, can I just ask another query? The Sustainable Action Fund at the top of, in climate change, on top of page 19, appears to have fairly low carbon impacts. Um, so that's just something, you know, that might be drilled into. Um, but building on, on what was said by Professor Foreman, um, I just like to bring two new recent develops to your, developments to your attention. One is that, that in September we held a carbon accounting conference for cities and communities. And um, it was terrific, hosted here in Edinburgh. But it was very clear that the cities and communities in Scotland were not getting sufficient assistance in providing credible, transparent accounting methods for them. And I think this is being looked into now, but they seem to be rather at a loss how to accu <coughs> more accurately develop their um, own accounts at a community level or a, a campus level if you're a, um, a university or something like that. So really, I'm not seeing anywhere in the investment streams where you're supporting communities and individuals and building owners and so on to actually do proper accounting or develop the methodologies. Now it's being left to for cities like Aberdeen has just put out a tender to do a, a carbon account for their whole city. Well presumably that's appearing in the line of the, um, the, the expenditure on local government. But surely if every city has to relearn the tricks um, of how to accurately account, we should be having some central organisation there that will, with it, or, or, or management program within the government. Where would that sit? Would it sit within building regulations? Or um, I'd just like to flag here that communities and organisations need more central support to ensure that they're accounting on on comparable lines and that their outputs can be compared so they can actually develop that. So that's one funding stream that's not in here. And the second one is that um, Scotland is, I don't know if you were listening to Question Time the other night with the, from the Welsh Parliament or the Wel Wales, where they were talking about energy and energy is one of the biggest drivers. of The way to decarbonise Scotland is to decarbonise its energy supply primarily. Well, Scotland is leading now on community energy systems where decentralised community energy organisations can use new technologies to use smart control systems to balance supply, local stochastic renewable supply, with demand. And um, this is something that looks as if it's going to be really effective. So I was... I don't know whether that would come out of the Climate Change Policy Fund. It's not quite clear. Or the Supporting Sustainability Fund. But it's, um, it's a way in which, which we can, in Scotland, help to also keep the lights on. Do you remember last year we had the whole north of Scotland blacked out for some hours? Um, by decentral and providing more robust and resilient energy units. 
Um, so I would just like to flag that there's a lot considerable investment from the energy team, I think, going into developing community energy Scotland. But that is one way. We've proved through research in the north of Scotland, where we're leading using European grants, that you can have a step change in emission reductions by managing energy systems locally with smart systems. Just, just like to say that that's a programme that should be integrated into that. Well, maybe let the uh, Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee uh, know that in their deliberations. Can I just move on to ask if there are any examples of projects or pro programmes which have a negative impact on reducing our uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I would say that, as I, as I said before, I would say the um, expenditure um, or the, the, the additional expenditure that we're seeing in this budget from last year on uh, roads and motorways um, does not appear to be particularly well justified in terms of its uh, potential carbon benefits and therefore potential knock-on uh, carbon reduction benefits. Um, the, uh, so the motorway and trunk road expenditure... Um, makes up the, whilst the, the overall transport budget has increased, um, that's largely due to this increase on the road um, network. Um, and um, the, as I said before, the, there does not appear to me to be any um, discussion or certainly inclusion of any policies to lock in the um, potential increase induced traffic that might result from that road building. So um, what, what you essentially have with that kind of policy is um, a slowdown in, and I know we're not talking about congestion at the moment, but with a slowdown in the rate at which congestion will, will happen, but congestion will still, without this lock-in, still um, result. It will just be further down the accounting line, if you like. Um, and um, the, um, the fact that this expenditure isn't balanced well by um, attempts to mitigate the impact of traffic growth in urban areas um, means that um, there's very little in there to reduce carbon from roads other than by reducing the carbon of the fuels and the vehicles themselves. So um, my recommendation would be to think again about um, what could be included in terms of traffic management and demand management. Okay. Yes. Um, following on from that, um, I would like to point out that a lot of the energy, uh, the, the sort of the people doing the standard energy analysis, analyses um, for Scotland and at a country level, systematically um, ignore the potential for solar energy to you to um, to decrease um, carbon emissions from the built environment. And there is a second consideration here that we're not looking at the social impacts because for every solar home you put on the, the fuel, for the fuel poor, for instance, we did a big study in, in Dundee, um, you're taking families out of fuel poverty forever by putting hot water and photovoltaics on those houses. And we, we did a very good study um, showing that if you put um, solar energy or fuel po um, photovoltaics and solar hot water on all of the council houses, in the um, s deprived areas of central Dundee, you could take the majority of the population of poorer people in Dundee, socially deprived people, out of fuel poverty, over 2,000 families, at a cost of around, for instance, 67 million, which is, I think, a quarter of the cost of the proposed Aberdeen Ring Road, is it? So. When you're looking at whether you take entire cities out of fuel poverty and reduce carbon at the same time, significant amounts of carbon, as opposed to developing new roads, you know, you don't have that sort of trade-off context where you're looking at bangs for bucks in project by project. That might be an, a good way of actually um, 
showing MSPs where, how their respective bangs are being spent and how many carbon bucks they're getting rid of, vice versa. Okay, I think we can move on. Adam, would you like to continue the questioning? I think uh, the co comparison with the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route is not going to go down with some members of this committee. <laughs> Thank, thanks, convener. Um, I think we're all agreed it's rather difficult to evaluate the impact of uh, the budget on greenhouse gas emissions. But would there be something... Um, relatively straightforward that could be introduced in the budget in terms of uh, providing a bit more information that would help us uh, with that evaluation in the future and what might it be yeah i i fear i've i've possibly been a bit negative about about the um carbon assessment of the budget um and i think it's worth noting and and, and acknowledging that it was really groundbreaking, probably the first government in the world to do it when it was first done, um, was it four years ago? Um, and that, that is great, and I'm all in favour of, of accountability for greenhouse gas emissions, and you've got to start somewhere in terms of producing some kind of an account in order to have accountability. Um, but I think, you know, it's time now to keep Scotland at the forefront of this area and to develop what we're doing um, so that it, it continues to provide a leading example for other countries to look at. Um, there's a, there's a, the, the really big question is whether, whether to move away from the economic input-output analysis methodology into something that is more bottom-up. Um, but if we if we stand back from that big step for for a minute, um, I think that you know there there are some incremental improvements, such as um, it may well be possible within the existing model to separate out sectors that are covered under the EU emissions trading scheme from the other sectors, and to differentiate in the accounts, you know, still produce the overall figure, but um, split it out after that into. Uh, the emissions from the EU ETS sector, which we can't really do very much about, and those that are not covered by the EU ETS, where we could still do further things that would actually show up in a, in a real difference in emissions. Um, that was one thing. The other, the other thing that is incremental might be to focus more on the changes in the budget allocation from year to year. Um, and really, really to, to say, well, you know, within, within a, a certain portfolio, the, the change is in the area of such and such, and that happens to be, you know, a high carbon or a low carbon part of the budget, and that gives you a sense of where the, where the changes in the money are, are um, going to result in some sort of impact in future. Um, then beyond that, I think, is, is the question of, you know, do you actually start to um, pull into this assessment um, some of the bottom-up analysis that is being done elsewhere and make much more effective links across the different carbon accounts that are being produced? And I think that that could also be done, you know, in a step-by-step in -step, uh, way because we've got all the analysis done for the RPP2, it should also be possible then to say, well, you know, the, 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 the changes in budget allocation from year to year can be linked to changes in those um, proposals and policies that have already been estimated in a bottom-up way, and therefore you could make some rough estimates of what the budget changes are likely to result in. Okay. Yes. As I said to begin with, that we've done some studies of carbon emissions in relation to GDP at city level. So, if you actually show the trends in how much GDP or you know expenditure per per capita actually is happening in terms of a money line with a graph over time, and then you put alongside it 
for instance, for each sector, the carbon emissions, you get a very clear idea of the trends in expenditure and the trends, respective trends in carbon. So you can see where the carbon impacts with increased or decreased expenditure are happening or where you're getting step changes. It makes it very visually, you could, you could quite easily do this for each year since 2006 and um, f with just the carbon emissions. And that would make it much more easy to comprehend. Good. Uh, the other question I was going to ask is you, you mentioned um, the carbon accounting methodologies. Is there such a thing as best practice in, in this area? You mentioned the fact that we <coughs> ought to be uh, assisting our cities and communities in terms of, uh, of doing this type of thing. What? We're very lucky in Scotland to have some really good carbon accounting <coughs> organisations and companies, and, and in the UK as well. Um, I, I think um, there are different methods. People make money from carbon accounting. So you go to a particular company and, and they'll have a black box, yeah? And you'll feed in your data and they'll come out with an answer um, that is not transparent or... or um, comprehensible really because they've put their own assumptions into the box but um, that's because they're selling a product whether it's city level accounting or community or buildings or companies but um, it's quite easy to develop um, and we've got the carbon accountants who can do it who can actually develop transparent accounting things which would be a Scottish methodology for carbon accounting for communities or cities um, which would make um, Scottish rules for Scottish assumptions because the trouble is with the larger deck accounting systems they use um, you know Westminster facing um, uh, assumptions so you'll have maybe 20 different values for a certain factor you put in for England and for Scotland you've got one value and we all know that Edinburgh is very different from Thurso so um, I mean, I, I don't know what the others would think about this, but it seems to be a very simple step forward to have first-class, transparent, accurate Scottish accounting rules for um, that the communities and cities and business owners can really apply for accurate Scottish um, accounting. Responsible for for drawing this up? And this um, well, um, for instance, Aberdeen City Council has just gone out to tender and they've got some very brilliant people tendering for that. And um, what the, the Scottish government has done to date already is, is they have gone out to tender, for instance, when they first developed this methodology in 2010. But it would be a matter of, of now just putting together a, a proposal and, and you'd get very good people from... Manchester, Oxford, you know, Edinburgh, all applying, and then you could choose the best team for a particular set of assumptions and rules. And then that would have to be ground truthed or tested with the whole of the carbon accounting community in Scotland that we agreed. But that's a fairly simple process. Okay. Um, rapidly in all sorts of venues um, all over the world. Um, and you know, one of, one of the peak bodies is, is the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which is a joint venture between the World Resources Institute and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, they, they first came out with the corporate carbon accounting standard that is now the kind of de facto um, reporting standard for corporations. Uh, but since then, they've produced a, a lot and are still producing a lot of new um, standards. One is in the area of community um, greenhouse gas accounting and another is in policy and action accounting. So we, we should certainly keep an eye on uh, those sorts of developments. What they do, they, they develop very dense and very credible and creditable um, accounting methods but a local community looking at these documents which are sort of yay big with very dense technical um, material in them um, really sort of would flounder. So some way of 
getting a, an internationally GHG protocol facing, but easily usable and um, Scotland-centric accounting methods for, for like communities would be very welcome, I know. Before they've thought it was too hard because, it, and, and they, they've used a lot of sort of fudges and what ifs, but I mean, it's perfectly possible now that they've produced the GHG community protocol to reinterpret that um, for, and that would mean that people involved in bottom-up action planning for carbon reductions could feel confident that they know where they fitted in the, the larger different scopes of the accounting process. More strategic um, Scotland-wide uh, approach that um, would that would adapt to, would that be adaptable to a more strategic approach as well? Can you create a methodology for Scotland that can be, um, if you like, uh, trickle down to communities? Is that, is, that, is that possible? It's a matter of compatibility because the Scottish Government has already a very good methodology which they're continually improving. And you'll notice in these appendices, Appendix A and B, they've detailed some of the developments because they've significantly changed and improved certain sections of their methodology. But any sort of bottom-up methodology would be important to ensure that um, you had compatibility between the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach and also between sectors. Um, so I'll give you an example in the forestry. What's happening in Scotland now is community groups who account for, say, peat or forests or agriculture are now sitting down around the table and saying, well, actually, what, I, what do I need to do? I need a, fat, a large estate owner to be able to say, actually, I'm having better carbon results if I keep it, uh, reinstate the peat or I put in forestry or turn it to agriculture. And you have to then integrate the methodology so you can, you can get a compatible reply. So that, that's happening, I think. But it's, so we need compatibility between sectors and we need compatibility vertically between top-down. Hmm. I agree with most of that, but I, I think it's important to recognise that um, it, you know, it's horses for courses. You, you, there is no one single methodology that will work for all the different needs. You have to think about what is the type of decision that you're trying to support with the accounts and then choose an accounting methodology that's appropriate to support that particular type of decision. And you know, we, we, will, we will have accounts that are incompatible with each other because they're being generated to support different types of decision. But it's, it's important to kind of recognise that and, and foreground that so that people don't expect them to be compatible or don't expect them to sort of add up all the time um, unless, this, unless This is they where are the importance of transparency yeah. has, is really important so that it might not quite be compatible, but you have to know what assumptions are made, whether the assumptions are compatible. You know, for instance, are they using the same carbon factors or... So, um, I think the movement towards more and more uh, black box systems is not going to enable people to make perhaps the best decisions, but... Okay, yes, Mr. Professor Foreman. Could, could, could I come back to the... The strategic point, because I am slightly bemused by the fact that the words digital and broadband, neither of them, occurs once in that carbon assessment of the, of the budget. Whereas, if you go back to policy documents earlier, we have uh, our low-carbon economic strategy sets out how Scotland can secure the transition to a low-carbon economy. Digital technologies will be an integral part of that transition by, for example, replacing goods and services with virtual equivalents, allowing more efficient use of energy, offering virtual technologies that allow online shopping, teleworking, and access to online public services. So that was there in the strategic documents. That's three years ago now that that was published. And yet, we're talking about this as though digital has nothing to do with carbon. And unless we make those kinds of linkages, we're just 
we're just watching what's happening and we're not going to make any change to what's really happening in the end. It'll just be, well, these houses are slightly more efficient than they used to be, these cars are slightly more efficient, but basically people are making the same journeys, they're doing the same things, they're leaving their lights on, they're, all of that is just lost. So unless you include it in the assessment, you will lose it, I think. And I think that goes also for other issues that were pointed out, like the fact that building roads means more people will go out using the cars, so you'll actually put the carbon up by reducing the congestion in the long term, because you'll only reduce it temporarily. But again, the, this comes down to the um, transparency of the assumptions that are made, and um, it's, it's not that some of the predicted um, traffic growth uh, will not actually include some of the assumptions about induced demand on roads, um, but it's not always transparent as to what has been included. And um, the, 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 uh, the other thing is that when it comes to such interventions, such as, say, some of the digital interventions that you'd mentioned earlier, whether it's home working, teleworking, video conferencing, home shopping, etc. They, those are precisely the sorts of inf interventions that are very, very difficult to evaluate and to predict because of their, um, well, for one thing, the, the sort of behavioural changes that are embedded in those take a very long time to materialise, potentially, um, that in the early stages of, of some uh, types of intervention, the carbon reductions are very small, but the longer term, the potential for longer term impacts, particularly cum cumulatively across interventions, um, can be very large, can lead to sort of uh, step changes down the line. Um, and so the, the combination of um, the scrutiny that's given in the short term to individual interventions versus the need for, for looking at cumulative impacts over a longer term can be um, a big problem in accounting, which um, I, I haven't seen particularly well um, addressed um, in any of the sorts of accounts that I've looked at. And, and because um, certainly um, in the transport sector, and I would say very much in terms of the sort of digital economy, you are actually needing to consider many types of intervention which are actually small scale, um, that although the evidence suggests that the, the sort of value for money in terms of uh, benefit cost ratios or whatever type of um, that kind of accounting is included, although that, that evidence is quite clear that those sort of BCRs can bring very, very good value for money when things other than carbon are included, such as health impacts um, or, um, or economic impacts, um, that's, um, that's not the case when looking, scrutinising individual measures for carbon um, and not looking at cumulative longer term impacts. Um, if, if I could just go back to your very first question and just add one, one further answer to it. And so the question was, you know, what, what further changes could we make to the carbon assessment of the budget being done at the moment? Um, one, one thing which I think would be possible using the existing economic modelling would be um, to, to think about the fact that government, um, that it's only representing half of the equation at the moment. So government has an impact in the way it raises money as well as in the way it spends money. And with the transfer of, of more taxation powers to Edinburgh, that um, may well be something more relevant in future. Um, I think, again, it would be a world first to start to actually look at the impact of government taxation on greenhouse gas emissions as well as the way it spends. Um, it will suffer, you know, using that model, it will suffer from all of the same problems. And so the same sort of comments would apply that, you know, um, it will only look at sector averages and things like that, and it should perhaps be supported by narrative about what is being done to ensure that those taxes are actually greener taxes than, than might be represented by sector averages. Um, but, but I think it would be an interesting um, and, and feasible further development. Okay. Yes? Um, yeah. just, um, just a quick point is that in the, on page 11, figure three of the carbon budget, for some reason, energy, water, and waste are lumped together. 
um, we at 40%, whereas we have mining and quarrying at 1.3%, finance and business at 1.2%. Um, did you know that the, the largest single user of electricity in Scotland is the water industry? So I really do think that we need to get some definition. How much of that is water? How much of, of that is energy? And how much is waste? Because <clears throat> are we hiding something here? Do we have a, an underlying problem that is being masked by this being lumped together? OK, if we point. move... Mm -hmm. All right, sorry. sorry. OK, on Are you finished? Go. Yes, yes okay. thank you. <laughs> you can come back at the end if you've got time. Um, if we move on to transport then, Mark, you've got some questions on this. Yeah, but <coughs> as well as the focus on greenhouse gas emissions, we've also got a focus on um, the sustainable and active travel budget and the um, elements of the budget associated with reducing traffic congestion. I'll just kick off by by asking if you feel that the, the current level of funding for the sustainable and active um, travel projects is adequate and whether that's been delivered to the best effect. Thank you. Um, my, my understanding um, of the budget is that in real, in real terms, uh, the expenditure on active travel and, and public transport has reduced overall. Um, looking at specifically at um, sustainable active travel, um, the, 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 ex the expenditure for the coming uh, budgetary period, 25 million, um, I, I've looked at that in the light of work that I've been involved with in, uh, with respect to smarter choices type interventions. Uh, some of my work has been um, in Scotland, in England, evaluating demonstration type programs, the Smarter Choices, Smarter Places program in Scotland, and um, within doing some quite detailed analysis of, of where individual um, expenditures across uh, providing alternative transport measures versus promoting them, um, looking at the, the expenditure per capita and what kind of the optimal balances of expenditure are. And there's, there's rarely been um, a, a sort of study that I've either been involved with or looked at that has um, suggested that the expenditure per capita, if you were to look at this on a, you know, this 25 million on a, on a per capita basis would be so low. Um, essentially, the, um, the, the, the sort of expenditure that you're looking at is, is sort of 1%, around 1% just over of the total transport budget. Um, it, if you, you follow the analysis forward of the, the sorts of valuations that we've looked at, it should be more like around 3% for those type of local sustainable transport interventions. So as a direct answer to your question, I'm afraid, no, I think it looks like a very disappointing level of expenditure, and it's, it's particularly disappointing that it actually appears to have reduced. And so would you say that 3% figure that you mentioned is a more um, appropriate figure going along with international comparisons? Yes, going along with international comparisons, going along with what we've understand understood from our evaluation of what works, which is obviously the most important uh, thing. Now that expenditure, there's, you know, there's all kind of complications in there in the sense that um, different levels of expenditure are required uh, uh, depending on sort of geographical area, for instance. So, um, and, and also according to baseline, you know, where there's already well established um, uh, sort of social norms and, and, and levels of provision, that expenditure could be less in areas such as, um, particularly hard to reach areas such as suburban areas rather than, than town and city centres, for instance, that requires a slightly um, higher level of expenditure on a sort of per capita average basis. Um, so, you know, but, but that's, that's just an average going on, on, on studies that have tried to really sort of scrutinise this type of expenditure. Of, of the money that has been spent, do you think that that's been spent in the right areas? Do you think the government's focus is in the right areas or that? 
spend should be transferred into other areas? I, I think there's, there's been um, a fairly <coughs> scattergun approach um, with a fairly limited budget um, in, in most recent years. Um, with the Smarter Choices, Smarter Places type of expenditure, that's a different model of spending that type of funding in as much as it's, it's looking at sort of exem exemplary projects which, which does, a, does a particular job and did a particular job. We learnt from that. Um, it's now, I think, spread far too thinly and not, not very strategically. Um, I think um, it's also very difficult to answer your question in the sense that it's actually not very clear what the um, expenditure on active travel um, is going to be, in fact, as far as I can um, uh, understand uh, what's, what's in there. I think um, there's, you know, as I say, there's one, one route would be to focus on sort of exemplary and um, sort of strategic type, type projects, but I don't see that in the budget, but neither do I understand what the delivery model is for spending the money um, filtered down to uh, the local level. I think um, uh, expenditure on, on, on sort of active travel, local sustainable travel interventions is actually best spent at the local level, except uh, what I would say at the moment that this na national approach, um, sort of central funding, also needs to exist very much so um, in the meantime because local authorities don't have the, frankly, the skills um, uh, uh, and people in place to be able to um, deliver those kind of um, projects in, in many instances. So until that's the case, this central kind of budget line um, is actually quite necessary. But at the moment, I find it very difficult to understand what the, the delivery strategy is for that, that line of funding. OK, thanks. Just to come in, Jim, on this. Just a supplementary on active and sustainable uh, travel. I um, absolutely take your point about the need to increase investment. That's something that those of us involved in the cross-party group on cycling have been very active in um, pursuing and promoting. But the figure that you quoted, of about, as I understand it um, from the budget, is 1% to 2% of the overall transport budget on active and sustainable um, travel. Is your understanding that that includes the match funding from local authorities? Because there are some local authorities, such as the City of Edinburgh Council, which is the coalition between two parties, um, which is now committed to spending 8% of its transport budget on um, sustainable and active travel. And I'm just wondering if, if you No, you're absolutely right. I, I, I haven't included that in, in, in what I've said about the 1% to 2% figure. Um, my, 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 one of my reactions to, to that, though, is that, because um, you've, you've brought up Edinburgh, Edinburgh is a place where there have been um, some good improvements in walking and cycling rates. Um, uh, but when you look at other areas, if you look at the surrounding, surrounding areas of Edinburgh or other areas of the country, um, that picture, unfortunately, is not, not quite as clear. So there's, there's two things there. One, um, you could take that as, as, as evidence, as, as testimony to the increased level of expenditure that has, has gone on in Edinburgh um, and, and proof that it, that's what you, what you need to make it work. Um, but um, uh, it's, it's also um, the, the, the fact that walking and cycling um, out with those kind of areas is actually reducing um, is, is very disappointing. I'd like to pursue the issue of demonstration um, projects on my own question later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. On Mark. My other question was um, about the funding available to reduce um, traffic congestion and just again to ask uh, whether you're confident that the budget lines will contribute to reducing traffic congestion and again if that's been spent um, in the best areas to do that on a long term basis. Um, again, I'm, I'm afraid um, I'm not very positive. I don't have, um, and, and, one, and again, one of the reasons why I don't feel able to be positive is that the, it, I don't see any um, clear targeting of any of the, the expenditure towards um, traffic management and demand management measures, um, which are, you know, for the real congestion hotspots. So what, I, what I'm seeing is um, the alleviation of congestion through 
largely through road uh, expansion um, rather than demand management. And, and as I said before, yes, that will lead to prob uh, potentially to uh, an improvement in the national performance indicator of congestion, um, but it will only be delaying um, the problem pushing the problem further into the future. So it depends what, uh, what you want to read into the, the, the indicator in that sense. OK. Do you see there being any areas of conflict um, between the, the budget line supporting um, reducing traffic congestion or supporting sustainable active travel and the commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions? You've, you've already touched on it in terms of increased um, road building and the, the impact that's going to have in the future. But are there, are there any other areas where you're seeing a conflict and that those, um, those budget lines are going to see a long-term increase in greenhouse gas emissions? Well, the, the, the encouragement of alternative fuel vehicles is a, is a very diffi difficult area in all of this. So I, I, I think it's very difficult to argue against the idea that we need more efficient vehicles, that we need um, cleaner fuels. Um, the, but what, you're, what, what that doesn't do is address issues of congestion, certainly. It doesn't necessarily help um, uh, to... Um, uh, it, does, it doesn't help active travel. Um, there is very little for us to go on at the moment to... Um, understand how new vehicles will be used in the future. So our modelling, our, our assessments are undertaken on the understanding that these new vehicles will be used in the same way as vehicles are used now. So it's just kind of a retrospective fitting of current travel patterns with cleaner vehicles. Um, but that's um, not necessarily what some of the more behavioural intelligence, if you like, would suggest might happen. So the idea that as people sink um, more money into these vehicles, as they are going to be more expensive, they have the potential to be used more. Um, so there is a direct area of conflict there in terms of um, encouraging uptake of vehicles on the one hand that may end up being used more but trying to alleviate um, traffic pressure on the other hand. Okay, thank you. Okay, Gordon, you want to carry on on this theme? Uh, before I move on to my, my own questions, I was going to ask you about traffic congestion. Just to follow on from the, part, the point that, that Mark's raised, how do you measure the impact of cycling uh, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon reduction? Well, that, this, that is it's precisely another one of the examples of, of what I was alluding to earlier. It's, it's incredibly difficult because of its incremental um, nature. It, 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 the up t increasing an uptake of cycling, um, A, is very, can be very slow, slow process. Um, B, it's very difficult um, to evaluate often to understand whether that cycling is additional or whether it has um, supplemented car-based travel. It may also... Um, be taking away from bus travel, um, which in a congested bus situation may be a good thing, um, but overall for, for bus revenue and therefore um, for the sustainability, if you like, with the bus system, it might not be. Um, cycling can interfere, <coughs> interfere with buses. It can uh, reduce running times um, using cycles and bus lanes, so there are conflicts that can happen. Um, so um, it can be incredibly difficult, but um, thinking... So that's why we have to think more in terms of the, the longer-term picture, what we want our towns and cities to look like, um, the degree of road space um, that we feel we uh, could give over to alternative modes and think about the, um, the, the impact in from the integrated transport system rather than any individual mode. So we have to plan it that way and we have to evaluate it that way in an integrated way um, because I see very many dangers in trying to evaluate these individual interventions in a, in a transport system. I mean, it's very, very difficult to retrofit a road in a city um, when you're talking about additional space. So you could actually be in a situation where cycling um, could actually increase the gas house 
greenhouse gas emissions because you've got 20 vehicles travelling at 10 miles an hour behind a cyclist and they can't overtake because mm -hmm. it's one lane either way. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have to think about the longer term impacts that if we... As, as we increase cycling, the idea is that more, more people, it will become more of a norm, more people will cycle, and eventually they may actually start to um, reduce the number of cars in their household. But that's the bit that's likely to happen over a very long period. Um, and that, that, that because of the way we account um, for, for carbon reduction, we don't think about the potential for bigger shifts in the future in terms of household car ownership um, that could take place as a result of increasing these, these other modes. The questions I was, I was actually going to ask um, was in relation to um, the Scottish Government's comments that they've got regarding their infrastructure budget. And what they've said is that an efficient transport system is essential for enhancing productivity and delivering faster, more sustainable growth. And it goes on to say that ongoing investment <coughs> in transport also connects regions and people to economic opportunity. So given the link between housing and transport, along with the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, are there any missed opportunities in this budget where we could have developed a more sustainable transport infrastructure? Uh, I think... Um as, as you've just alluded to in, in your question, uh, the, the missed, missed opportunities uh, can be in not looking at uh, land use planning policies and our transport policies together. Um, so there is, there's, there's some, some uh, I think, a, you know, a lack of joined up thinking in terms of where we are developing versus our, um, our transport infrastructure. Um, I, um, a, a more specific point in relation to the transport expenditure, it was, um, again, I'm afraid, uh, a bit disappointing to see the reduction in expenditure um, on, well, there wasn't a reduction in expenditure on rail, sorry, I haven't got the figures right in front of me, but there seemed to be a misopportunity to use some of the savings that are um, being generated by uh, less expenditure on rail franchising um, and use that to accelerate the, the capital expenditure um, program on rail. Um, so whilst that capital expenditure program is still healthy and it's still in there, it could have been um, accelerated. Um, because in, in the context of um, uh, thinking about the relationship between transport and the economy, um, there are some very interesting changes that are taking place structurally in the transport system and in terms of car traffic in particular. Um, and we've seen since pre-recessionary times, we've seen some evidence of the increase in car traffic slowing down um, during the recession. As we would expect, we've seen absolute reductions and we're starting to see a, a sort of an increase again in car traffic. But the missed opportunity is looking at that, that trajectory and seeing whether we can lock that in, whether we can sort of um, try and um, uh, tap in to some of the changes that, that had already taken place. And, and within those aggregate figures of slow, slowing down of growth of traffic, of traffic, one of the things that, that's been going on underneath that is a real increase in rail use. Um, and so, hence my um, my suggestion that that's a real missed opportunity, particularly right now, as we as we perhaps as we could perhaps be looking at these these sort of structural changes and trying to actually push them um, in 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 positive directions. Right. Anybody else in the panel want to come in? Um, I'm well, possibly going to preempt something that you might say. I'm not a, not a transport expert, but. I would really love to see more evidence of um, digital smart thinking um, being, being in, uh, invested in, in the transport sector. Um, Something similar. A few years ago, I wouldn't have dared suggest this in a place like this because it would have really seemed a bit wacky. Um, but driverless cars are a reality now, and we have to start thinking about how we will use them how we use shared cars, how we can make it more efficient to go around our cities or along our motorways, because that will happen in many places in the world, and if we want to be a leading nation, we have to think about it. And I think, 
defer to the transport ex experts on how that will happen, how it will integrate with the other things we're already doing, how the road uses change, but I think it's something that should be on our agenda right now. Um, while, I've, while I've got your attention, can I just say something about missed opportunities? We, we see lots of opportunities for reducing transport use by people having digital connectivity, and we actually see that happening in remote communities quite a lot. But the current investment in digital in Scotland is not going to bring super fast speeds to a large proportion of the people in the Highlands and Islands. In Scotland as a whole, it won't bring what the, you, uh, sorry, in Scotland as a whole, for, for those who are not currently served, at least 44% of them won't get super fast speeds according to the current definition from the EU. And the idea is that everyone should have those by 2020. We have invested some almost 300 million, I think, in broadband over five years. We're investing 800 in rail, 400 in buses and ferries over one year. So I think there's a missed opportunity in saying this can really change the way things happen if we take it seriously. But I don't believe it's been taken seriously in the UK or in Scotland as yet. I mean, there is a section on digital infrastructure coming up uh, shortly, but is there any other, and you, you mentioned Professor Foreman about driverless cars, but is there any other examples of international best practice in relation to low carbon transport that are suitable for implementation in Scotland? I think the digital thing has already done quite a lot. I believe, and I'd be interested in comments on this, but I believe the, the increase in uh, passenger numbers on Lothian transport owes an awful lot to the buses app because people can tell when a bus is coming and they'll wait for it. And that makes a huge difference. The sort of ability to integrate different transport ski, um, providers is something we don't do very well as yet. So Glasgow doesn't have an integrated transport app the way that Edinburgh does. It has individual ones for different, different companies and that's missing a trick because for the user, you just want a bus. You don't actually care who's turning up with the bus. You want to know when it's going to turn up. So I think there's a lot to be done in making the information available to people to make the, the public transport option more attractive, and digital can help a lot with that. Something, something where we, um, we, we, we led the way, and, and to a certain extent, was um, the Edinburgh City Car Club, which is now City Car Club and all over, all over the UK, and there's many other similar car sharing schemes around the world. Um, I, I think it's a fantastic initiative. I was a founding member of it. And, um, you know, cars are just incredibly inefficiently used assets. We have millions of them just sitting around doing nothing most of the time. Um, and so I think that there's, there's got to be huge potential to expand schemes like that, um, you know, maybe, maybe by Using, using smart technology to enable people to actually donate their own cars into the scheme. You just have to put a little, little box you know, in, into your car and then all the time that it's sitting there and you don't need it, other people could be using it. Um. I, I think if I can comment on both those things. I mean, firstly, on the car clubs, I think uh, that that is something I would uh, congratulate the Scottish Government for in their support uh, to car clubs in Scotland. Um, I'm afraid I got a little bit confused as to where it sat in any of the, the budget lines. I think it's in the Future Transport Fund um, uh, and, and extra money has actually been given to car clubs to roll them out. Um, and, and there's been some very innovative thinking about the size of settlements uh, that, that car clubs could be appropriate for. Um, with, with initial support, but thinking longer term, thinking about their, um, their, 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 how they can actually help promote alternative fuel vehicles, electric vehicles in particular, um, how they can be connected into the grid in island communities and so on. So I would say that's something that's really very progressive and ticks a lot of the boxes about inter integration across digital, across transport, energy, um, and, th and thinking very much about social exclusion issues as well. Um, so that's, that's quite important. On, um, on, on, on the comments made um, about um, sort of real-time information in transport, I, I, th I don't think it's overstating it to say that the, the biggest revolutions, such as there has been any, in transport 
in recent decades have been digital. So the idea of information, the idea that people uh, are now um, much more looking to use their travel time productively, um, and that's one of the, the reasons behind the resurgence of train travel. It's also a main reason why, uh, or not, not necessarily the main reason, but a, um, a significant contribution to why uh, younger people are delaying car use and um, we're seeing uh, more more walking because um, you can listen to music while you're walking. This, this is all sort of evidence-based coming out of, of recent studies really trying to understand why young people are delaying the, their uptake of, of car licensing and, and owning cars. And a lot of the reason is because they want to stay connected on the move. Um, and so, again, it's just to underline the importance of joining up these genders. I was just going to say that um, I don't know if you're aware that under the Scottish building regulations, uh, a modern office block will fail if it's naturally ventilated and pass if it's um, air-conditioned. And so when we're talking about transport, we're talking about the entire quality of air and pollution levels in city centres do. So this big move, so when you're creating visions of future Scotland, we really do have to look at this link between air quality, noise, uh, transport approaches for city centres, and the nature of the buildings in cities. Because this, um, by removing um, substantial you know, anything but sort of more public transport approaches from the city centres, you're enabling, for instance, designers to open the windows, if you noticed today, um, here. So um, there are huge knock-on effects on the vision of what we think our transport futures should be. And there's another thing, too, which is climate resilience of transport systems um, and commuting patterns um, and what we saw during um, the recession when, you know, the middle incomes, mid middle class, as they say, are, are evaporating as, as wages aren't going up and yet costs of living are going up. The cost of petrol at the pumps has a huge um, impact. And commuters who were commuting in from Fife were beginning to, in their sort of like SUVs and so on, were beginning to be extremely squeezed um, in terms of monthly expenditures as the 120 pound a gallon a, a tank went up to 130 and 140 and so on. So um, I think these issues are something that where would they be covered in the the future transport fund or? Um, but but really this importance of creating a vision of a low carbon society and a climate resilient society and also um, a cost of energy society has got to be integrated into the thinking I think Okay, anything else on that? Before we move on to uh, emissions and housing I think we should have a very short comfort break so less than five minutes if anybody wants to, to move
Okay, if we can re uh, resume and go on to emissions and sustainable housing. James, you've got some questions on that. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, convener. Before going on to emissions and sustainable housing, um, if I could just maybe go back to some of Pro Pro Professor Rolf's initial comments on accounting methodology. He commented on the fact that the accounting methodologies had changed. Can you just expand a bit and pro provide some clarification on that? Um, in, if you, this is sorry. This is from the carbon assessment of the 2015-16 budget, right? Um, what they did was um, they've made a number of changes to the method um, that they used on this is page four, uh, calculating the input-output um, figures. And um, they say it's, they've used an improved methodology. And um, they give us, um, a, and that's in, in Annex, uh, sorry, Annex A, details of the methodology. Um, and th they've got a number of ways in which the methodology changed. And they say that in terms of the changes, it had relative impacts. So, for instance, the new UK SIC07 analytical chain tables, they changed the tables, and that had a 16% impact on um, the actual it pushing up the, the figures of the Scottish Carbon government. And then the revisions to the greenhouse gas emissions ratios pushed up the actual emissions for Scotland in the method by 25%. Um, and then they had an industry fixed product scale increase it by 2%. And the production of the closed economy of the UK tables, um, that, in, that increased it by 67%. So they used different tables. So they've changed the tables they used for the method, and they've included a couple of other um, additions or, or um, developments. And so they say how much change it had to the overall step increase that resulted in our carbon emissions, but they don't actually tell us what, what the percentage of the step increase was. So we know what it's composed of, but how big is that? Actually, has it had um, a million tonnes impact or five million tonnes impact? So th this is where we need clarification on that. Yeah. <clears throat> so we need more. The methodology has been changed. And yeah. We've got some figures on it, but we need more detail to properly understand the impact. We just need to know how much how much of a shift change that's resulted in. So if they'd used the old methodology, would it have been 8.8 ton, a million tonnes, or would it have been 6.5? Uh, you know, what scale of that change? Did you notice that one? No. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank, uh, thanks for that uh, explanation. Yeah. Um, just in terms of uh, housing and regeneration, what, I, I know we've covered some of this as we've gone uh, through the, the questions, but what was your, what's your kind of general overview in terms of the impact of the budget as outlined in the draft budget document uh, in relation to the objective of reducing <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions? Um, it seems to have spent an awful lot of, so the, the bulk of the money has gone on increasing the housing growth, growing the housing supply, right? Um, 628 million. And then they've got a figure for, and, and the, the impact of that was 187 mi um, thousand tons of CO2 equivalent resulted from that increased spend. Um, but supporting sustainability, they spent £90 million pounds on supporting sustainability in the housing sector, but it wasn't really clear um, it's had, that's resulted in an increase of CO2, 27,000 tonnes. So um, surely, I mean, if you're having a huge investment on supporting sustainability in the housing sector, wouldn't 
you actually expect that to result in a decrease in emissions, not an increase of emissions? I take, I take the, the point that you make. Um, and just kind of following on from that, uh, in relation to you know, good practice, you gave some really good examples uh, throughout your contributions in terms of you know, building standards, um, the solar panels in Dundee, and uh, you know, the air conditioning example that you gave just before the break. Um, in relation to specifically to housing associations, uh, are, you, are there any examples that you can draw on either in Scotland or um, throughout the international community that you think would be good, in, uh, particularly in relation to housing associations? Um, very much. Um, there, there has been over the last 10 years, we've been pushed from Brussels to do something called passive housing standards, which are, I think very much sort of 1990s thinking, you know, increase the insulation, get rid of the um, drafts, uh, better windows, um, get rid of cold bridging so you're not leaking heat out of buildings. But the passive house movement puts in um, heat recovery and recirculation systems, yeah? So the passive house movement um, sort of started with fixing the windows so you can't open the windows in the housing and having a lot of the, um, the, the um, heat, apparently the heat you're losing from buildings being taken by ducts through the ceiling, put through a heat exchanger, which is supposed to grab the heat back from the air you're ex exhausting and mix it with the incoming air with a fan. Well, these systems cost about five to seven thousand pounds each, probably about seven thousand pounds to install in housing. And um, they um, actually usually duct air behind the ceiling, behind the plaster of the ceiling, and you've already lost the heat anyway to the, the roof space. So they're not actually regaining much air at all. And um, this move to have fixed windows in housing has been um, really for Britain, which is quite a damp, um, temperate climate, it's really not suited to it. So um, housing associations have actually moved into um, putting these heat exchange systems in housing um, and even in places fixing windows so you can't even open a window for ven natural ventilation to get fresh air in or so on um, and putting in sort of huge windows that are very difficult to open anyway. You get a lot of modern flats here in Edinburgh with lightweight timber structures sort of west-facing large glazed areas you probably see some over there which are suffering from significant overheating as well. But... Um, for £7,000, you could put, four, nowadays, you could put four kilowatts of photovoltaic, so solar electric, plus a solar hot water system, or three kilowatts, on the house. So for the same price, you could have a house that never actually pays for only 20 to 30 percent of their hot water in the year and can really generate most of their electricity free. So this move, Joseph Roundtree Trust has just taken out 425 um, heat recovery systems out of the houses because they were creating such poor air quality. So um, when you put sustainable inv investment here, £90 million, um, all I'm, my hope is that it, it's going you know, definitely into putting... Um, sort of renewable energy systems on the buildings rather than these heat exchange systems which are failing in large numbers in Britain. And if you notice on page 19 of this document, in the climate change of the rural affairs, you've got a land manager's renewables fund and um, um, that has resulted in... Um, um, significant investment into renewables in, uh, in, on uh, agricultural estates or in forest estates. And if we could think about that in housing, because the only way you're going to take people out of fuel poverty is give them the means of generating the energy they need on their own roofs and hopefully putting some storage. You see store energy water storage tanks? Do you remember in the old water storage tanks, we have 25 million homes in Britain... Well, that water storage, the hot water tank, was storing heat. 
So if the lights go out or you couldn't afford to pay for the heat to be on all day, that would store that heat for you. In 10 million homes in Britain, they've taken this water storage tank out of the house and put in combi boilers. So you've got no heat storage at all. So um, I would say that, you know, we've got a fair chunk of money here. Let's putting it into making sure that people have um, heat storage in the home and the opportunity to, to generate their own energy from their own roofs rather than rather flawed mechanical systems which are being pushed very much by industry. Okay, I think those, goes, those are points are well made and they're good practical examples which I'm sure the, the committee will, will take on board. Just finally a question for um, Professor Foreman. Um, just when you spoke about the importance of you know, digital infrastructure investment and the potential opportunities that that can give. Again, in relation to you know, areas of, sort of social deprivation, um, where there's not a big digital uh, uptake, and there's obviously a great opportunity there if we can uh, get people to uptake on digital, the, the information and the opportunities in their lives uh, are tremendous. Um, what do you think can be done to encourage digital up to uptake in, in areas of social deprivation? Well, there's not very really. good work going on by the Glasgow Housing Association, where they're piloting, in fact, in partnership with BT in this instance, they're piloting basically bringing one supply into a multi-occupancy building and then sharing it out between all the occupants in a way that does give them each their own individual access, but quite different from the standard way that it's done in the UK of everybody having a line, their own line back to the cabinet. This is one line to the building, and then it's shared within the building. Uh, that reduces the costs substantially, and I think the results are very good on that. And I think Glasgow Housing Association is working to expand that over its tens of thousands of premises. Um, so, so that's excellent. I think. The investment that is being made has done huge things, or is doing huge things, to bring fibre to some of the remote parts of the Highlands and Islands, and that's also excellent. It will, with the current investment, it will bring normal services such as we have here to people who are close enough to the cabinets, but of course, in the Highlands and Islands, many people aren't close to the cabinets. One of the things that I think we're missing at the moment is any clear idea of how third parties other than BT will be able to use that infrastructure to provide locally and to do things such as have been done by the Glasgow Housing Association to say, we'll have one big pipe and then we'll share it out. The, the access to that infrastructure is still at best unclear. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Okay. Um, Alex, do you want to move on to Thank digital you very much. infrastructure? The, I was going to cover the area of digital infrastructure, and of course we've touched on that many times, and I'll try and go through this uh, fairly briskly and not cover all the ground. Uh, I've heard what you have to say, and I think I've got the message, to be perfectly honest. But uh, I wonder if the panel has any views on uh, where digital proposals uh, or digital infrastructure proposals in the budget uh, actually have positive effect on the targets that have been set for greenhouse gas emissions? Oh, on the greenhouse gas emissions? I would say anywhere where you give people the opportunities not to travel because they're doing things virtually, where you give businesses the opportunities to, to use cloud computing that can be provided by energy efficient data centers rather than trying to do it themselves. It's, it's very easy to build yourself a lot of computers or even a fairly small number of computers that compu consume a lot of electricity and do that locally. You can get much more efficient use of the computational power if you have good connectivity to a well-engineered data set center which can use energy much more efficiently. Um, we've talked about the impacts on, on transport those are certainly there. Uh, so I think rolling out digital is going to help, but the problem is that our rollout will not be complete with current plans. In other words, not everyone in Scotland 
we'll have the opportunities to do those things. Mm. You, you mentioned the issue of uh, transport, and of course we all know that in an ideal world everybody will take the chance to work from home rather than commute. Uh, but what do you see in the, the budget proposals that will actually drive that kind of change forward? I didn't see anything specific in the budget proposals that would drive that kind of change. There is work going on on digital literacy. Uh, there's work going on with um, SMEs to encourage the use of digital. So I think those will indirectly drive that kind of change. But I don't think I've seen anything that I could say this is targeted at using digital to reduce, digital, uh, reduce carbon emissions. I'll, I'll now ask the open question, to which we've had some answers so far, but I'll ask it anyway in case there's more, because I, I don't want to miss this opportunity. And that is that what are the missed opportunities uh, in terms of digital infrastructure uh, within this budget? There's no new investment, although it's now, I think, well documented that we're going to be left with a residual problem when the current step change programme is finished. The amount of investment in dealing with the pieces that step change won't reach is minimal, I think, of the order of five million, there may be a little bit extra now, but it's, it's tiny. And the numbers of households that you need to reach are large in the order of 400,000. And actually, I think that number probably needs to be upped rather than lowered, uh, given what, we, what we're beginning to know about how many people have long copper lines and so won't benefit from the speeds, even though they're connected to, uh, to the fibre network. Have we come to that stage where we all know what could be achieved through digital infrastructure expansion, but we don't seem to be doing much other than carrying on the programmes we've had for a number of years? Carrying on the programmes we have, we have a, a strategic goal to be world class by 2020, but I haven't seen, I see no mention of investment beyond the current plans, which are all part of what was around a few years ago. Mm. And which is don't do a lot of good stuff, but won't complete the job. I'll, I'll caveat what I'm about to say by saying this is not an area that I know a great deal about, but I'm wondering if the committee might want to try and um, uh, get some evidence on this in a different way. But a lot of the digital discussion so far, but also I think maybe the way I um, saw it presented in the budget, is very much about rural and, and, and sort of targeted towards homes, I think. But um, certainly if we take the crossover between digital and transport, much of the potential lies in logistics and green logistics and so with businesses um, and um, in terms of green freight. Um, and I'm, so all I'm, I'm just sort of suggesting, recommending that perhaps just, just to try and dig around in that a little bit and, and understand whether that's something that is being targeted at all through, uh, through the policies and, and expenditure. I think that's absolutely right. The current programmes are pretty much exclusively uh, targeted at domestic access, though they will have some side benefits for business access. But if you look at the benefits, they're not about being able to stream video in the home. It's not that there will be poor people in the Highlands who, are, who, who it takes longer to download you know, a TV programme. It's about businesses being able to access cloud computing. It's about being able to have sensor networks that tell you what's going on. It's about transport networks being able to communicate effectively on the go so that they can have these efficiencies in transport. So those kinds of things. And at the moment, we don't treat the digital infrastructure as an infrastructure in the same way as we do with roads and rail and ferries. We think of it as a, a service to the home and, oh yeah, businesses get it too, but we don't think of it as an integrated infrastructure that actually enables communication between two points and where there's a very open market in anyone can use it for all sorts of innovative things that we haven't yet thought about and we're missing out on that opportunity of making it open to innovation. Thank you. There's one other issue I wanted to 
ask you about, which is slightly different, and that is, what are the panel's views on the transfer of funding for the Next Generation Digital Fund to the Rural Affairs, Food and Environment portfolio? And what do you think this does uh, in terms of affecting the ability of infrastructure and capital investment to monitor the effectiveness of current and future digital infrastructure programmes? I, I, I think it takes it away from the limelight and somehow devalues its importance doing that. Um, it certainly doesn't allow somebody to look at it and say, this is actually a national infrastructure we're talking about. Uh, it's, it's saying, well, there's a problem at the end of the line, we'll let the people at the end of the line deal with it. I don't think that's the right way to think about the problem. Because the world is changing very rapidly, we've got things like energy prices fluctuating, we've got climate change issues coming up. Um, Energy is becoming scarcer and energy security much more important. And whole new industries are emerging in the wake of it. It's what we call, uh, I don't know, sort of um, low exergy energy approaches. But what that really means is that in the, traditionally you took work to energy, right? So you would take the grain to the mill or you'd take the logs to the mill by the water or the... Um, you know, the grain to the mill on the hill or something. Nowadays, where we've got huge energy users, and the biggest one is data servers. So now there's a whole new movement. Uh, Google's major data server is north of the Arctic Circle. Um, and what they do is they move the data servers that have Absolute, huge amounts absolutely. of heat. Yeah, <laughs> and so Thurso is another one where huge cloud, cloud potential. We have phenomenal potential in the north of Scotland for a whole new generation of cloud servers and services. Um, and we were discussing this the other day because what you need is you need energy storage so you have constant energy, which is going to increasingly go off in the south of of Britain, so they chose Thurso because they're investing with Norsk Hydro on um, tidal energy. So you've got constant tidal energy, you've got cold, and you've got um, potential huge amounts of, of, of fairly predictable energy also from from wind. But what's going to be? And, and for instance, you probably know that in Loch Arbour, in the northwest of Scotland, 93% of all the energy there is used by the Alcan plant which has got a huge reservoir, constant water. And so we have opportunities to open up whole areas of Scotland um, for industries that want secure areas to develop with constant energy, you know, good schools, good working, good travel communications. But one of the things that's missing is, is that... Uh, assured digital connections. So, so we have. So, it's a major revision of how we see what we can offer industries by looking at the infrastructure in that context. Major competitor to us in yeah. that particular market is Iceland, as, yeah. as you said, because they not only have coal to cool the thing down, they also have geothermal to produce the electricity, mm. and they're halfway between Europe and America and they've got very good connectivity with fibre so they can put data centres there that are actually closer to Europe and closer to America than one in London is to America or one in New York is to London. And that really helps when you're doing arbitrage on the stock market so that their data centres are very important. We have fibre coming from Iceland Telecom in at Durness. If you try to get a connection between Durness and Edinburgh, uh, you find no one wants to sell you one because it, there's a monopoly. And selling one would actually open things up in a way that the current owners don't want to do. So it's very difficult to look at the whole of this infrastructure without understanding also the market. If we look at roads, anybody can take a truck on the motorway and go once you've built the motorway. We haven't ensured that that happens with the motorways that we're building for our digital infrastructure. So the fibre that's going in in the northwest is available for others to join at the end to provide to domestic premises, but as I understand it, it's still not opened up for connections to business premises. And until it is, that 
means that very few people will want to go and invest because the money can be made in providing it to the business premises. So we haven't opened up this infrastructure to be a national infrastructure that provides connectivity between any two points. It should be the case that once there's a fibre there, we can get a decent price between Edinburgh and Durness, between here and Oban, you know, the whole lot. And there's a lot of fibre going in, but it won't be as open as it should be. Would, would it be fair to say that extending the, uh, the, the digital infrastructure into every corner of the country doesn't make it rural? It's still mainstream. It's still mainstream. Oh, absolutely. It's still, it, it needs to be still mainstream. Mm -hmm. And what's more, if it's there and it's properly, properly opened up, it will enable everyone to play the same kind of game as people in Edinburgh can play or as people in Shoreditch can play. Uh, Ardman Animations, the people who do Wallace and Gromit, are based in Bristol. Their big thing is they need good connectivity, which they have, so they have very fast pipes to the states and stuff, but they need good connectivity to the people who they farm work out to, because the way they do these things is they have illustrators and so forth working. So they're very concerned to be in an area where not only they have 100 megabits per second, and in fact they probably have a gigabit a second now, but where the people they're working with have 100 megabits a second because the size of these files that they're pushing back and forth are enormous. Now, if you have a fibre connection, those people could be in the north of Scotland if they had a fibre connection going between the two. I mean, you might be able to re-envisage, say, the Black Isles and, and the Moray Coast as being, you know, a digital highway for... You know, it, it, it really, it's, it's not about some folksy little but it's not kid just, getting a, a connection no, 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 in a it's not about farm. That. But it, it's, it's not just getting the stuff there, it's making sure everyone has the right to use it. And in the 19th century, there were issues with the rail network exactly the same. An act of parliament had to make it possible for people to move from one train line to another because people built their train lines so their stations didn't in interconnect because they didn't want their competitors to take their business. Okay, so it had to had take an act of parliament to push those things together. And we haven't done that here for the digital. Thank you. Fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. Cold is becoming important. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got any questions on digital infrastructure? In the... You need an act of parliament. Uh, <coughs> I think the problem is which parliament would have jurisdiction over this matter. Um, ser seriously, the, the access and the openness of these things is regulated by Ofcom. There are European Union conditions on the openness to uh, publicly subsidised infrastructure. I, I do not myself understand how what Ofcom is currently doing complies with some of the openness requirements in the state aid uh, approval that was granted for the BDUK project, which includes the, the, the step change. So I believe that at the moment that's an issue for Westminster, but um, parliaments, well, parliaments can do what parliaments manage to do, so who knows? Look, okay, yeah, I'm tempted as I am to tease out that response. I think we'll, I'll move on to another question. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I've got a couple of questions just to, to wrap up what I think has been an incredibly valuable uh, session. The first one is about um, emission targets and second is about innovation. So I can ask you firstly about how confident you are that the current um, programmes and funding allocations that the government is committed to will actually contribute to Scotland meeting its ambitious climate reduction targets of 42% by 2020 and 80% by 2050, and also whether you feel that the shortfall that there has been in reductions which arise from the failure to meet our targets in the years 2010 to 2012 is something that we can uh, make, make up ground on. I, I, I do think that um, it hasn't been taken seriously enough, and I do think that a language for carbon accounting for everyone from sort of school kids to communities to businesses, we really need to, to develop a better means for accounting for um, everybody to take part in it. Um, so I think that we haven't had enough expenditure in Scotland on that, although we've got sustainability and lots of other things funded, that I think if we really want to do it, I think we need to develop a Scottish language 
and Scottish methods to account for that. As, as, a, as an outsider to the carbon debate, so I found the document on the carbon impact of the Scottish government's activities fascinating, but actually it doesn't tell us about the impact of the Scottish government's activities on Scotland's carbon outputs. And it specifically says, you know, second round emissions are not recorded in this assessment. And without that, certainly someone like me, fine, that's an interesting thing. It's nice to see that the government's doing a good job or maybe not doing a good job. We do similar things in the university. But what, what one needs in order to inform the budget in terms of the goal of reducing Scotland's emissions is some kind of document about the effects that these things will have on Scotland's emissions, and it's not there. That, that, that's how it looks to me. Maybe I'm just yeah. being naive, but that's how it looks to me. I've, I've made that point to you. Yeah. You're, you're referring to the overall Scottish um, carbon account, right? Not, not, the, not the draft budget. Yeah. Um, it's, whether, it's whether the allocations um, in the draft budget will allow us to to fulfil the targets that have been set by the Parliament. Can be achieved. <laughs> um, I, I think that we would probably all agree that there is, there is more that can be done. In, there, there are so many different sectors. We've talked about buildings, transport, digital infrastructure, etc., where more, more can, can, be, can still be done. So, is there the possibility of meeting the targets? I would say yes. Um, I, I'm not really able to comment on how confident I am because that's, that's about predicting the, the, the future and it depends on the, the effort and, and um, leadership that's put into that. Can then continue to do what we're committed to doing. Will we be successful or, do we need, or is there a significant step change that is required? If, 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 I, you know, if I add, add to this, I'll only really be repeating what I've just said. There's, uh, sticking, sticking to transport, which is what I know, I don't see how uh, the transport sector can pull its weight with respect to um, achieving the climate reduction targets. Um, there, are, um, uh, th there is a big reliance on very uncertain policies, um, and that's um, mainly around vehicle emissions and vehicle efficiency. Um, that technology is um, coming along in leaps and bounds, but the, the rate of uptake and how it will be used is very uncertain. Um, and one of um, the, the, the one of the reasons we always say that the transport sector is such a difficult uh, sector to um, try and do anything with in terms of carbon reduction is because it's a, um, it, it, you know, we've locked ourselves in to car dependency. We've um, infrastructure that takes a very long time to change. Uh, the problem is we're, we're perpetuating that with the policies that we are investing in. And um, although some of the, um, some of the, the policies that uh, we've discussed in terms of active travel, behaviour change, smarter choices. In and of themselves, they appear to have a uh, very small impact on total carbon reduction. Uh, the point is the degree to which we are going to be able to rectify any um, uh, 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 rectify the situation quickly if we continue to not reach our targets. And um, what we need to think about is building in flexibility into our systems. And um, I mean that from everything from, um, you know, uh, uh, pe people, their competencies, their ability to have the choices that they need, that they need to have even if they're not exercising it at the moment, um, to um, infrastructure that we can um, adapt quickly. Um, uh, you, you've, you've, I think, probably gathered from some of the things that I've said that my expertise lies on the behavioural side. Um, the sorts of work that I've done has um, shown very clearly that people who currently 
are, for instance, much more multimodal, less car dependent, are able to react to things like disruptions, whether it's winter weather disruption or, or system breakdowns or whatever, um, they, they're, they're their own personal resilience is much greater. And that's the kind of thinking that we need to build into our systems um, more generally, is thinking about even if we're not expecting people to change now, if we needed them to change much more quickly in the future, um, have we got things in place to allow them to do so? I think um, you know we should put it in a global context of um, not being on track, anywhere nearly on track, to meet the maximum of two degrees of warming. Uh, you know, we're much more likely to be looking at a world of four degrees of warm warming. Um, and, and therefore, we should be realistic about the fact that the kind of changes that we need to achieve over the longer term are, are radical. They're, they're, you know, completely um, unprecedented. Um, and therefore, yes, you know, relative to relative to really the, the business as usual or the world where, where we don't care about the climate targets, it really is a huge step change that we have to achieve. Um, but in terms of, you know, sort of year-on-year -year achievement of targets, I, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and volatility in the data. It depends on economic growth to a large extent, um, it depends a lot on imported emissions from the rest of the world because um, the, the, the imported emissions part of the total carbon budget for Scotland is, is the most volatile bit. So I wouldn't be too worried about missing a particular year's target as long as the, you know, the actual underlying actions are, are in place. You know, it's much more important for example, to be locking in lower emissions, the lowest possible emissions in long-lived assets like the built environment, like transport infrastructure, and in future, the, the digital infrastructure, um, than it is to meet a, a short-term target. Why aren't we meeting these targets? I mean, Scotland, we're producing nearly 50% of all our energy, the energy we use, with renewable energy systems distributed, right? One problem is that um, while the demand is, is, and supply are out of sync, um, we're, we're not actually maximizing the carbon benefits of the energy we generate. We should be leading the world in, in carbon emission reductions. What we need is storage. <coughs> so we can put storage in, and that's storage at all scales. So whether it's, we've got um, mountains we can use for double-pumped hydro. Every house, if we could introduce storage into the house so um, we reduce the need for, for very frisky energy. So um, I would say that the one way to decarbonize an economy is to run it on renewable energy. So efficiency has been a great god in the past, but actually it's how you generate the energy to do the work that matters. So I would say that at every level, at building level, building integrated solar systems, electric and, and hot water, community integrated renewable energy systems, and regional. But this again is going against a lot of the interests of the, the big six who run our energy systems. But I think Scotland, if they could emphasize <coughs> getting maximum capacity and using the buildings to do it, getting maximum energy storage into the system, there's no reason why we can't meet, meet the targets because there is nowhere virtually in the world that's more blessed with free energy than we are in Scotland. And eventually, markets will, will move industries to areas where you have cheap energy. And that's what we can do. We can, we can lead that too with the right digital infrastructure. Thank you. Um, that's fascinating. I wanted to finish just by asking if each member of the panel could provide, and you possibly have already in the answers to previous questions um, answered this question, but provide the one innovation be it in terms of policy development, um, infrastructure investment, or good practice that you think will have the biggest impact in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I know, obviously, um, Professor Annabel, you talked about demonstration projects. Professor Rolf, you've 
given us a myriad of examples from decentralisation of renewable energy supply at a local level to solar panels and deprived and housing in deprived communities and tackling um, having a, you know, more forward looking building regulations that capture um, the the actual emissions and, and have that on the certificate. And Professor Foreman, you've uh, alluded to infrastructure investments in the digital economy. But is there, is there one thing out of all of the issues that have been discussed this morning that you think will have the greatest impact on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions? And if I could go from left, my left to right. Okay. <laughs> you. Okay. Um, I actually think this thing of opening up the fibre infrastructure, we now have an internet exchange in Edinburgh, uh, but if you're in the west of Scotland and you want to connect to that internet exchange, you, you will pay an arm and a leg because it's a long way away and you pay a distance-based charge. If we could have a way that from anywhere in Scotland you could connect to that exchange and then exchange data with other people, that would change the digital economy in Scotland. And it would allow all these kinds of things to, to happen that, you know, changing the digital economy will have wider effects, but it will also allow the, these various things that we talked about in terms of uh, reducing carbon to happen locally. What's the investment required to, to do that? I, I think it's, it's more a matter of regulation or cajoling than investment. It's getting people around a table and saying, we need Scotland to have this kind of a market where people can access these things freely and competitively, uh, rather than putting in more stuff right now, because we've done a lot of putting in stuff. You will then find that there are other places that want to connect, but the business case for making those connections will be stronger because there will be more people able to use the connections. Thank you. I would put, it's, it's a really simple solution. I would make sure that every house in Scotland has a solar hot water system on the roof plus a hot water tank um, because solar energy on a house not only provides free energy in perpetuity, but it changes mindsets. So you, it changes the way people see energy. But also, thirdly, it, um, and that would reduce by about 10% the total energy demand of Scotland, just to make everybody have their own heat. Um, but it also means that the people, like I know here in, in Gorgie or Stenhouse or wherever, who never actually turn their heating on, the real fuel poor, usually the elderly, um, who never turn their heating on in winter, would have some reserve of heat in winter that they, they wouldn't die of cold, which they did in 2,500 did in 2010 because they couldn't afford to turn the okay. heating on. Uh, and the same question to you as to uh, Professor Foreman. What would the um, level of investment required be to, to roll that out as part of... 500,000... Sorry, yeah. Um, over four... Um, I, I can't give it off the top of my head, but I could give you a figure. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, um, yeah, I'm, I'm tossing up between two things here. I mean... Um, uh, well, I'll allow you to have two examples. Uh, well, OK. Really well, well, for, well, first of all, I think um, that we, have to, we do have to change our mindsets in transport around um, what it is we're aiming for. And actually, most of the transport in, innovations to fix transport are not in the transport sector. But in the interest of answering the question directly... Um, I think we need to think about um, rolling out car clubs more widely. I think, uh, so the sort of change in mindset there is thinking about promoting access to cars and not ownership of cars. It's, you know, it sounds, sounds quite simple and in many ways um, it is. Um, the growth in car clubs where they um, are now happening, Aberdeen has had the fastest growing car club, faster than, than, you know, Edinburgh was the pioneer, but now where they're being put in, the rate of growth is actually quite phenomenal, obviously from a very small base. Um, so I do think it is um, something that we're doing already that I would like to see taken, um, taken further. No, I'm not going to do that. I will think about it and I'll come back to you. I'm, I'm not prepared to put a number to it uh, quite at the moment, if that's okay. I'm going to duck the question slightly because... Um, we'll see about that. <laughs> uh, because you, th there, there is no one thing that, that 
that does it all. You know, so um, we we prioritize. Uh, sure, but, um, you know, we, we could completely yeah. decarbon. We could have all zero carbon buildings across the, the country. That wouldn't be enough. We could decarbonize the, ele the electricity supply sector. That wouldn't be enough. Um, so we we have to have uh, innovation across the board. And so I guess that leads me to, to saying that you know maybe the, the the thing is is in catalyzing innovation and the knowledge around this. Um, I don't know how you, I don't know, you know, sort of what, what number, what sort of figure of investment to put upon that, but really to make Scotland, um, you know, Scotland is already at the forefront of a lot of this stuff. Can you be a bit more specific? Um, you know, make, really making Scotland a Silicon Valley of low carbon solutions for the rest of the world to, to look to. Um, and I think that we are already doing that There's in, in many different ways, but... Um, Perhaps you know, offering the University of Edinburgh as a laboratory for that, is it? Well, we, we are doing a lot um, at the University of Edinburgh, for sure. Um, but I think, you know, just re really, really investing in, in the knowledge economy <coughs> around um, low-carbon innovation, I think, is one, one of the things that would connect up the many different um, silver bullets that are needed in, in all the different sectors. I, I think a lot of those institutions, there, there's some in the rural college, there, there's the uh, carbon capture and storage, that there are various centres, but actually I'm sure that none of them would object to spending more money and getting more brain power onto these things. Okay. And it might be worth doing. research it's about quick uh, you know short pathways from research to implementation and really really getting much closer connections between the business community innovation in the business community innovation in the academic community okay excellent that's been very helpful thank you okay anyone else got any final questions Okay, I'd like to thank the witnesses very much. That's been uh, very informative and, and very useful. Um, and I suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to leave the room and to allow the committee to move into private session. Thank you.